Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Polygenic Risk Score Analysis for Alzheimer's Disease Risk, presented by Dr. Richard Pither, CEO of Cytox. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit them at thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Richard Pither, CEO of Cytox. Dr. Pither has been involved in the development of diagnostic and therapeutic pharmaceutical products for more than 25 years. He's been the CEO at Cytox for the past seven years, a precision medicine working on developing and commercializing a new diagnostic technology for assessing Alzheimer's disease risk. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Pither, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Susie, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today, today about uh, polygenic risk score analysis for Alzheimer's disease risk and the opportunities that this affords, uh, much needed opportunities for transforming the uh, prospects for development of new uh, Alzheimer's therapeutics. During the course of my presentation, I'm going to be covering uh, an introduction to the clinical challenges of Alzheimer's disease and associated drug development. I'm going to be talking about polygenic risk scores and how they can be used, and specifically how they pertain to the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And, and what we've been developing at Cytox, which is a polygenic risk score algorithm that, with the trade name of, of GenoScore, and uh, how that performs in longitudinal clinical studies, and the subsequent implications for stratifying uh, subjects into clinical trials for the future and the prospects for clinical trial enrichment. And of course, that in turn will influence very positively, we think, the prospects for new drug development. You can see on this slide, which describes the challenges of Alzheimer's disease, uh, the huge problem that we, the industry faces. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but it is one of four or five recognized types. Uh, constitutes between 50 up to 70 percent of dementia and the problem that the world faces today is this escalating uh, problem associated with an aging demographic in the developed world uh, the costs uh, today are estimated at, at uh, uh, about 800 billion worldwide and they will uh, treble uh, by 2050 and, and one of the challenges associated with the uh, development of new drugs is, is uh, addressing the, the failure rate. We have not, not seen any significant new drug approval since 2003, uh, and that's associated with the problems of finding uh, the correct subjects for enrollment at the earliest stages of the disease where the drugs that were in, uh, are in development have the best prospects for working, uh, to the point where the screening failure rate is, is over 90% in some studies. Uh, we, what I'm going to talk about today is how genetics and polygenic risk scores in particular can help uh, improve that success rate. So, of course, Alzheimer's disease is not purely a genetic disease, and I'm talking about the late onset form of the disease, as I'll describe in a moment, but actually manifests itself uh, as a consequence of genetic inheritance um, and also exposure to environmental and lifestyle risks. And that's illustrated on this slide here. Um, we're all born with our, uh, an inherited level of genetic risk. Uh, the question is uh, whether that risk becomes manifest at the level of disease symptoms. And as we can see, as we get older, uh, those symptoms uh, can be very mild in the preclinical or prodromal phase of the disease uh, and then manifest uh, as uh, clear dementia later on. Whether or not um, a, a defined genetic risk becomes manifest at the level of symptoms 
um, seems to be um, a measure of uh, how well we manage our exposure to other risk factors. And I've listed some of them on this slide, uh, such as cardiovascular risk, hypertension, uh, whether we take regular exercise and, and uh, eat a sensible diet, uh, whether we have <coughs> diabetes or whether diabetes is under control, a whole series of things that can be managed um, in a high genetic risk individual might well push back uh, the time at which symptoms become apparent. And, and that's, that's very important in terms of uh, clinical management considerations going forward. Now, there are uh, a number of ways we, we, we can intervene to, to, to decide whether or not someone is in a high-risk category today by the use of very invasive and very expensive biomarkers, but these have significant limitations. So if we look at the left-hand side of the slide here, uh, we can see uh, two curves. Uh, the yellow curve associated with normal age-related memory loss. As we all get older, uh, our, our cognitive functions tend to decline uh, naturally but very slowly. Um, and well, some of us will be on that more precipitous blue and red curve associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, and this is not a normal aging process. What is happening at the time of those symptoms, or actually about 20 to 30 years before those symptoms, is a build-up of underlying pathology in the brain associated with amyloid plaque, neurofibrillary tangles, and other pathologies. And, and so they, we have a window, we have a 20 to 25 year window where uh, we could intervene therapeutically uh, to actually uh, affect the, uh, the outcome of that disease process. So on the right-hand side of this slide, on slide five, uh, we've illustrated here a couple of the techniques that are used today in the form of amyloid positive, uh, positron emission tomography imaging, uh, which is effective at picking up amyloid in brains of uh, uh, its sub subjects, even pre-symptomatic subjects, but is very expensive you know, at, at sort of $5,000 plus per scan. And of course, the earlier you go in the disease process, the less likely you are to find someone with amyloid. And so, Typically, in clinical trial recruitment, you may have to, to carry out uh, 10 scans to find one positive individual. The other option here is a lumbar puncture, where we're taking out a sample of cerebral spinal fluid to look for telltale uh, amyloid and tau protein fragments. Um, but that's actually quite difficult to do quantitatively and reproducibly across many labs. And of course, it's highly invasive having to, uh, to take a lumbar puncture sample. So we've been working on uh, the premise really set out by Professor John Hardy at UCL some years ago that genetic analysis would be the most cost-effective uh, way of deciding who should be uh, assessed for using these more invasive techniques uh, for early signs of disease uh, development. On this slide, you can see actually that there are two forms of Alzheimer's disease, and our focus today is on the late-onset form, by far the most common form of Alzheimer's disease, probably uh, upwards of 95%, uh, maybe as much as 98% is associated with late onset, by which we mean uh, greater than 65 years of age. Um, there is an early onset form, of course, which occurs uh, in families, in discrete families, and these are associated with the dominant mutations in the amyloid precursor protein and the two presenilin genes. These are very well documented. Um, late onset disease, on the other hand, um, is associated with APOE locus, uh, as we'll talk about shortly, uh, but also with a large number of, uh, of loci um, throughout the genome. Uh, these 21 loci here were documented a few years ago in a, a well-known publication. But since then, there have been a large number, a much larger number uh, identified. And these, are, uh, sm these have uh, small effects, uh, and it's the cumulative uh, effect of, of these um, these, these, these variants that, that seem to confer risk for the late onset form of the disease. So Alzheimer's disease, uh, the late onset variety, uh, is associated with many DNA variants spread throughout the genome. Um, as of this publication, uh, back in 2018, there were over 40 different loci identified, each of which confer, the variants confer either a little bit of added risk or perhaps a little bit of protection for the development of the disease. Um, you can see on the right-hand side here, the APOE locus uh, is by far the most commonly associated with uh, increased risk. Um, but depending on where you draw the cutoff in this so-called Manhattan plot, we can identify uh, large numbers of other risk-associated uh, DNA variants. So to summarize what's needed um, on this slide, we, need, we can see that we need 
uh, effective uh, early identification, ideally a pre-symptomatic phase of at-risk individuals. And the solution that we're talking about today is um, a polygenic risk score approach, um, and our particular algorithm we call Genus Score, which is driven from a DNA sample, uh, either blood or a mouth swab, uh, which is then isolated from that sample, the DNA, and run on a proprietary array that we call Variatex. We'll talk about that in a moment. That Variatex array is built on a Thermo Fisher Axiom platform, run on the Gene Titan equipment. And then the output from that array is analyzed in our software platform, a proprietary platform called SNPfitter, within which the genus score polygenic risk score algorithm sits. Uh, so we get the primary gene typing data from the array that's analyzed using genus score in an automated workflow uh, run in um, whichever lab uh, we're working with that happens to have this equipment. So we, we work regularly with a Kesogen uh, in the US, with Eurofins in Europe, and we've worked extensively with the Ramachati Center in Australia. But essentially, we can work with any lab that has this uh, laboratory infrastructure. Okay, so the Variatec 2 array um, will be familiar to some people. Uh, we um, previously uh, had the Variatec 1 array. This is a new version, which contains something like five or six times as many SNPs, um, including all the original Variatec 1 content. Um, plus uh, optimized SNP panels uh, to drive the polygenic risk score algorithms. Now, the, the discussion today is really all about the genus score algorithm, um, but just for information, we do have other polygenic risk score analyses that we can carry out from the, the basic genotyping content of this array, uh, and that analysis would be available uh, depending on exactly what the experiment was trying to achieve. But you can see here, we've got various panels of SNPs, some of which arose from our collaborations at University College London with John Hardy and his group, uh, many of which come from Cardiff University uh, and are optimized to drive the algorithm uh, on which Genoscore is based. We'll talk about that shortly. And some of them are, come from uh, mTOR associated pathways, which are from University of Birmingham collaboration in the UK, which allow us to drive um, other, other forms of analysis. We have an extensive literature panel uh, covering all the early onset associated variants uh, in APP, PSEN1, and PSEN2. Uh, and of course, we have panels that would uh, allow us to do um, uh, pharmacogenetics, ADME type studies, uh, as well as uh, imputation if, if that was required. So, the Cardiff algorithm uh, on which Genoscore is based um, is, is one of the best published algorithms uh, that's available. and uh, uh, it, it has uh, some very key characteristics. It was trained in a very large uh, database, a very large training set, the so-called IGAP consortium uh, data set, uh, and contains a very large number of SNPs. So we're, we're talking here about an algorithm uh, which, in this publication, uh, the best accuracy was achieved using more than 87,500 SNPs or DNA variants. Uh, actually, the, uh, the genus score algorithm that I'm describing now has got a bit more than that. It's got a few more, 115,000 or so. And we find that this gives us um, the most stable prediction across different data sets uh, relating to Alzheimer's disease risk in the samples that we've analyzed, and for which I'll show you some data shortly. Uh, a final point um, on this slide is that um, the, the validation of the Cardiff algorithm has been done in, in completely independent data sets. Uh, some of which are pathology confirmed, which is a kind of gold standard for Alzheimer's disease definition. And so we know that the performance uh, is not just uh, due to the uh, overfitting in a training set, but indeed is uh, uh, preserved in completely independent test sets, which is a, a very important characteristic. And you can see some data here uh, for, from exactly those, uh, those sorts of test sets, which we'll cover in a bit more detail uh, on the subsequent slides. So, um, of course, the Cardiff algorithm is not the only polygenic risk score algorithm, and I would draw your attention to this paper that was published last year by Hannah Stocker et al., uh, which set out to compare the performance of different polygenic risk score algorithms uh, for predicting Alzheimer's disease. And, um, uh, and essentially what Hannah and her colleagues concluded was that of the algorithms available, the Cardiff algorithm the best performing, the highest performing 
in terms of accuracy, um, and it's one of only two that have been actually tested and confirmed in pathology uh, confirmed data set. So that, that's very important when dealing with a, uh, a disease which can be uh, quite difficult to accurately clinically diagnose without that post-mortem post -mortem histopathology correlation. Now, one of the key characteristics we're going to look for in any polygenic risk score algorithm is how it compares to assessing risk above and beyond APOE4. Now, you'll recall that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that APOE4 is a risk-associated allele. In fact, it's the most characterized uh, of the risk-associated alleles in uh, for late onset Alzheimer's disease. But carrying E4 itself or may give you an elevated risk, but does not in any way um, determine whether or not an individual will develop Alzheimer's disease. So it's important if you are an E4 carrier, and this slide illustrates the, the, the distribution in a general uh, cognitively normal population, in this, in this case in the UK. So about 23% of the population carry one copy of E4, the so-called E3, E4 heterozygotes, and these would be considered to be at relatively high risk, but we know that a lot of those people will not go on to develop Alzheimer's. Uh, conversely, uh, the majority of people will not carry E4, but will fit into the E3, E3 homozygote group, and yet we know something like 40 to 50% of Alzheimer cases come from that E3, E3 group. So we can see automatically here that um, E4 assessment alone will not be sufficient to, uh, to have any clinical utility in predicting the future likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease, and indeed that's the case. Now, just before I get on to share some data, <clears throat> a little point here that um, we, our job really in Cytox has been to take and build on the academic excellence of the Cardiff uh, research algorithm and, and turn it into uh, a validated product that can be then used ultimately in the clinic. So for that, we've, um, we've worked across a number of different data sets, um, including ABLE in Australia, University of Pennsylvania, Emory University and others. Um, and we have had to demonstrate robustness in all APOE genotypes. The algorithms that I'm, well, the algorithm I'm focusing on today comes from Cardiff University, but there are others available too that do slightly different things. For example, the algorithm from the University of Birmingham that we've developed based on the mTOR pathway. We can talk about that on another occasion, or people can ask questions about that should they wish. Uh, the array is a customized array built on the Thermo Fisher Axiom array platform. Uh, for reasons of uh, quality control, essentially. Uh, and we've got global access via our partners, uh, Kizogen, Eurofins, and, and other laboratories. So if we begin to think about the data now, um, why would we want to use, how would we expect to be able to use this type of approach? I think there are several key reasons. I mean, one, as I've touched on already, is to identify the clinical trial participants at the earliest stages who are most likely to cognitively to cognitively decline during the follow-up period of a therapeutic trial. So this will allow us, of course, to reduce trial subjects and the associated costs and increase the chances of demonstrating their therapeutic effect. We said already that we would need to demonstrate a performance above and beyond that associated with APOE genotyping alone. We'll talk about that shortly. And of course, uh, what would be ideal would be able to predict those at highest risk of meaningful cognitive decline, by which I mean measurable, objectively measurable cognitive decline within the period of a clinical trial follow-up. And then another point on this slide, and the last point actually, is, is to do with um, subtypes. So um, the expectation is that some drugs are more likely to be effective in some subsets of Alzheimer's disease sufferers than others. And um, th this type of analysis uh, lends itself to be able to effectively identify those genetic subgroups and therefore um, enrich in subsequent uh, therapeutic uh, studies uh, in, in, a, in a way akin really more to cancer drug development and the, the use of um, prognostic markers. Uh, the work I'm going to describe now has all been um, analyzed using the, the so-called ADNI data set. ADNI uh, stands for the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. It's a, a long-running uh, study that started in 2004 and comes with very comprehensive longitudinal follow-up data. 
and the subjects have been confirmed using PET imaging. So that gives us a high level of confidence um, based on the amyloid uh, burden in these subjects that the uh, clinically defined Alzheimer cases really are Alzheimer's disease rather than some other dementia and that the age match controls really are controls and not simply um, uh, pre-symptomatic at-risk amyloid uh, Alzheimer's subjects. So um, most of the work I'm going to be describing now has been done uh, in this cohort. Uh, there are over 630 uh, amyloid confirmed subjects uh, and these are very well age matched across controls and, and subject groups, the mean age is about 78. And what we can do in these analyses is compare the performance of our algorithm with other, uh, other forms of, of algorithm based on APOE alone or uh, combinations of APOE and other, other parameters as I'll describe shortly. So if we look across the uh, ADNI data set and we ask uh, how good are we, uh, how good is Gina's score at predicting clinical AD uh, from cognitively normal controls across all APOE genotypes, in other words this is everyone thrown in together, we can see that if you do that using the APOE alone, you have an AUC, an accuracy measure essentially of about 73%. Uh, the, the polygenic risk score algorithm without APOE component gives you about 70% in an APOE independent measure. And if you combine the two things together, uh, we come up with a, an AUC of 80%. So that's a significant improvement above APOE. But of course, this is in subjects who, uh, some of whom will be APOE for carriers. So if we ask the question, uh, what happens if we look at the E4 high-risk subset uh, carriers within this group? So these are the heterozygote E3, E4 carriers. Uh, are we able to differentiate a relatively high and relatively low risk uh, in this group? Uh, we can see that the, um, by establishing cutoffs using our polygenic risk or analysis, uh, in this case, uh, the top quartile fell at the 0.61 and above cutoff. We have a positive predictive value uh, of 84% the AUC level. So that's, that's, that's telling us we're able to pick out uh, the top quartile, the highest risk subjects amongst that E4 carrier group, and these are the people you might well want to enrich your, uh, your uh, clinical trial with. Um, and actually, if you take that, uh, that measure down, that, that cutoff down, to give you the top 50%, you're still at 71% positive predictive value. Uh, and this would be hugely valuable to anyone uh, wanting to enrich a study cohort uh, for those most likely to develop the disease uh, and therefore uh, the ones that should be uh, recruited into your clinical study. If we take the other end of the spectrum, uh, the apple E3 homozygotes, who would be uh, conventionally thought of as having relatively lower risk, uh, we can see here that we're able to, uh, to stratify, in this case by taking the lower quartile uh, with a negative predictive value of about 89 or 90%, so we could you definitely want to eliminate those subjects from the clinical trial. Uh, and on the other hand, if you took the highest quartile, uh, you'd be up at about 50%, so positive predictive value of about uh, 51% in this particular study. So you might want to include some of these in your clinical trial uh, so that your indication would extend to those uh, E3, E3 uh, homozygotes um, uh, within the, uh, the, the study parameters, within the inclusion exclusion criteria for your study. So, so if we look at the conclusions from the work I've just described and from other studies that we are continuing uh, to carry out right now, we can say that the stratification of the E4 carrier heterozygotes uh, can identify the subset of E4 carriers at the highest risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And of course, these are the ones you would want to stratify and enrich uh, into your clinical trial to measure therapeutic effect. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, the APOE3 homozygotes, uh, our analysis has sh clearly shown it's possible to identify a subset of these individuals at the lowest end of the risk spectrum and would also allow you to identify the higher risk E3, E3 homozygotes uh, to include in your, in your study design as well. The, the algorithm has the potential to improve uh, the ability to predict individuals who will convert, therefore, from mild cognitive impairment to AD uh, well over and above uh, APOE alone, and uh, given the uh, observations that um, enrichment of the MCI and, and the other prodromal at-risk subjects uh, gives you the highest 
opportunity to show the therapeutic effect. This is a very important observation. And we're doing more work at this, on this very question at the moment using the ADLI cohort and indeed using other cohorts as well. The um, <coughs> algorithm clearly has the uh, potential to select those patients who are uh, most likely to decline cognitively within the time frame of a clinical trial. And, and that's obviously crucial because without that decline in a reasonable period of time, uh, therapeutic effects are very difficult to measure. The, um, it's worth mentioning that our genus score and indeed other algorithms are available for research collaboration uh, at this stage, and we're working with a number of uh, pharma, biotech, and academic um, studies uh, at the present time. Uh, and that going forward, we, our intention is to, um, be, uh, to, to be engaging with the US and European regulatory authorities and look for full marketing approval for clinical version of our genus score algorithm in the 2021 timeframe. I want to finish by acknowledging uh, our team and uh, our other partners, very important partners, a very talented team here at Cytox uh, in the UK, and we work globally with collaborators around the world. Uh, key partners for us, as I've mentioned um, en route, have been the uh, Dementia Research Institute team at Cardiff University, led by Julie Williams and Valentina Escott Price, and uh, in particular, um, two very talented postdocs, uh, Effie Ballo and Ghana Dianenko, uh, and of course, John Hardy at the at UCL Dementia Research Institute, and uh, Mariam Shoai, again, uh, John's postdoc there. Uh, we've, um, of course, relied heavily in this presentation on the ADNI data sets. I'm very indebted to ADNI, and of course, Mike Weiner, the PI for ADNI, and not least all the patients, volunteers, and their families who contribute very important samples and, of course, their time uh, to commit to the uh, extensive uh, clinical evaluations that are uh, uh, very important in, in, in participating in those sorts of studies. Uh, our funding at CITOX comes from a number of sources, not least our investors, um, but also from grant money. We've received, um, continue to receive money from Innovate UK, uh, and, and we also receive money from the European Union. So thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering your questions in due course. And thank you, Dr. Pither, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question to be answered today is, how has your PRS been validated? For example, any independent verifications? Okay, Susie, thanks for that. Um, yeah, um, the, so the original training set, as I mentioned, um, well, the work was done by the Cardiff University team uh, in the so-called IGAP training set, a huge um, uh, longitudinal, well, uh, sort of ongoing study. Um, as and, and they themselves did validation in completely independent data sets, including pathology confirmed, uh, the so-called TGen data set, but then we've worked across um, different um, uh, you know, different clinical data sets from around the world. The, the, the work that we did was to take the Cardiff algorithm um, uh, and, then, and then test the, uh, the performance in the ADNI data set, this longitudinal 15-year uh, study that's still going on, and we, we generated essentially very similar data to the, to the Cardiff uh, validation work. Uh, we've worked also in uh, several other a longitudinal sample series, um, including some from pharma studies. Um, but what we're, we're going to do now is, is take this through to a formal regulatory validation study in an ongoing longitudinal uh, uh, sample set where we, uh, we aim to, to, to go for uh, FDA and EMA approval for using this technique uh, in, a, in a clinical setting. So uh, there are degrees of validation that are completed already, and this certainly supports the use in uh, research use only type applications, and there are more formal regulatory studies which are planned for the new year. Thank you, Dr. Pither. And do you offer testing as a service or do you provide the platform only? 
Okay, so um, what we've done so far is, is really done more collaborative type studies. So, um, and these could be of an academic nature, or they could be uh, with pharma companies. Um, we, we're approached on how how we should, you know, we we, we, like, we like to understand with the with our partners exactly the, the question they're trying to answer, and then we can work together to build an appropriate study design. So, um, for example, we we worked with the ABLE team in Australia. Uh, again, a very well-known longitudinal study. Uh, we were able to um, effectively send out our genotyping arrays to uh, their local laboratory, uh, University of New South Wales, collect the genotyping data there, and then do all the uh, the analytical work back in the UK. So we uploaded the uh, the genotyping data into a cloud-based server, uh, did the analysis here in the UK, and then provided the data back. So we can work in a very flexible way, uh, depending on exactly what the collaborator uh, is trying to achieve. Thank you, Dr. Pither, and I want to thank our audience for participating today. We have some great questions coming in. Our next question, Dr. Pither, is can you describe the key modules on the array that were important for the PRS algorithm? Sure, yeah. So um, there, there are fundamental pieces of information that anyone interested in outside research genetics will want to, to capture on an array. So, for example, all the uh, dominantly inherited mutations associated with early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease, because even if you're working with late onset uh, cases, you still want to know that you're, 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 you have a, a basically a pure, a pure data set. And so you, we use that in almost like a quality control uh, uh, methodology. But the primary aim, of course, is to make sure that you have good coverage of all the SNPs or the DNA variants that are needed to drive the algorithm itself. Uh, so for that reason, uh, the array is dominated by uh, SNPs that drive the Cardiff algorithm, but the, also the SNPs that drive the, the more research-oriented algorithm uh, using the mTOR uh, approach that uh, was developed by uh, Dr. Jujanaj at the University of Birmingham and that we're still working on uh, in very much in a research mode. So, um, so the SNP curation is, is dominated by um, the, the, function, the functional aspects of the algorithm itself. Um, but there are other elements on there as well. So, for example, uh, you know the the ADMI SNPs, SNPs associated with um, uh, wanting to uh, to look for uh, non alzheimer dementia associated as associations as well. They're, they they are extensively covered on the array. What we think we have with Veritech two is the most comprehensive collection of DNA variants and, and associated probes. Uh, for Alzheimer's uh, that, that there is available today. And uh, of course, we, we constantly monitor literature and if new things are discovered, we can incorporate those onto uh, next, next generation uh, versions of the array as well. Thank you. And does this PRS algorithm or another algorithm have any value in predicting the rate of cognitive decline? That is a great question. So, um, and I'm sure Many people will know that the, the rate of cognitive decline is of huge interest, um, not just to patients and their families, but to pharma who want to know, uh, you know how these things are determined and also whether someone's likely to be on a, a trajectory of decline that's measurable within the, the period of a, a clinical trial follow-up. So um, I, th I think the, the answer is that genetics plays a role in determining that, probably in some people. Uh, but it's, it's it's by no means the only role. So, for example, we know that uh, Alzheimer's disease often comes uh, as a part of a mixed pathology with a vascular dementia component as well. And it could be that that decline rate um, is is dominated by non-genetic factors in some people. Uh, that said, we, we are looking at um, uh, progression data. So within ADNI, for example, You've got individuals who have changed over the period of follow-up, say from cognitively normal to having a mild cognitive impairment or indeed full Alzheimer's disease, or conversely may have come into the study with mild cognitive impairment and then progressed to Alzheimer's. We, we are able uh, to use, or, or our, our, our work that we've, um, we're doing at the moment does suggest that it's possible to um, pick out those at highest risk of decline within a, a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Dr. Pither. And here's our next question from an audience member. What types of biological samples are required for SNP genotyping? Uh, 
Okay, so um, we have uh, validated our approach using um, either blood samples uh, or isolated DNA, genomic DNA, or indeed um, mouth swab, cheek swab uh, samples as well. So, um, so you know, we, we've used fresh blood, we've used blood that's been archived from clinical trials, and we've been we've used DNA that's been archived from clinical trials. And the nice thing about that, you know, DNA is a very stable analyte. So I mean, you know, we all know you can dig up woolly mammoths, you know, that were you know frozen for thousands of years, and and get sequenceable DNA out of them. So, uh, you know, we can use um, stored DNA. Uh, most of our work has been done with uh, biobank DNA that's come from longitudinal pharma and or observational studies such as ADNI or ABLE. Um, but going forward, uh, and we have done quite a lot of work already. Uh, we, you know, we expect to be using quite a lot of, uh, of cheek swab uh, samples, and certainly the FDA discussions we'll be having in a few weeks' time will include the use of both um, blood and uh, mouth swab uh, as starting points for, for DNA for this type of analysis. Thank you. And how do you see PRS being utilized in pharma? Well, pharma have... Um, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, they've got a, a huge challenge, which is to get into subjects early enough um, to hit that therapeutic window whereby um, there's a, an, an active disease process, but ideally that process hasn't progressed to the point where um, th there's nothing left to, to salvage. So um, we know that amyloid and tau are building up, you know, perhaps 20 years or more before clinical symptoms, and that provides a fantastic window uh, to intervene in a meaningful time uh, to uh, perhaps slow or even prevent uh, cognitive decline. Uh, the, um, the challenge has been how do you find those people? Um, we, we, we explained that the PET amyloid imaging and tau imaging is coming online too can be used, but uh, they're very expensive, very invasive, uh, very time consuming uh, techniques. And what you really want to do is stratify those people uh, uh, up front of, a, of an amyloid or indeed a tau PET scan before you put them into a scanner. And I think this is where our uh, technology can really, uh, really have a lot of benefit. Um, and, and indeed, that's, that's where we have shown benefit in, uh, in, in being able to enrich uh, amyloid positive uh, subjects, so reduce the, the, the number of wasted PET scans, if you like. Um, and then, of course, pharma that are looking beyond the clinical trial phase to a time when new drugs are on the market. And of course, you know, the most obvious example of this uh, in recent weeks was, was Biogen's announcement that the uh, the reanalysis of their uh, phase three data uh, from Engage and Emerge is looking quite encouraging. I mean, the question is, if that was approved uh, in the next year or so, how do you find patients early enough to start treating them? Uh, you're not going to be doing widespread uh, PET scanning or uh, or, or, or a cerebral spinal fluid analysis, um, you're going to need to find a way to identify the highest risk subjects before they go into those tertiary uh, sort of uh, screens. So we think genetics and, and polygenic risk score in particular could play a really important role in that setting as well. Thank you, Dr. Pither, and thank you again thank to you. our audience members for these great questions. Our next question, hello, and what do you consider an appropriate time frame for a clinical trial during which patients stratified as high risk group might progress from MCI to AD? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part is, how would such a trial have to be scheduled? Okay, so that, that's a great question. And, and this is um, completely aligned uh, with the kind of analysis that our technical team have been carrying out in the ADNI data set um, over the last few months. Um, and what we can see actually is that um, if we look at look at people with a, a clinical diagnosis of MCI uh, within ADNI, uh, and then we ask, uh, could we predict progression uh, in a two, three, or four year time frame to a clinical definition of Alzheimer's disease? Uh, we're able to do that with a, um, a, 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 an accuracy of around about 70 plus percent, uh, it depends exactly on uh, which um, criteria we're using, uh, but 70 plus percent uh, 
which is a pretty good positive predictive value. Uh, so in other words, these are people you'd really want to enrich uh, the, uh, above a certain cutoff with a polygenic risk score. You'd want to enrich these in your clinical trial because these are the people at highest risk of cognitive decline, uh, and these are the people that uh, you'd be able to potentially demonstrate uh, benefit in. Uh, e equally important, we've been looking at progression from cognitively normal to MCI, also in ADNI, and we can also see uh, a very good performance of our uh, polygenic risk score in the highest polygenic risk score subjects for progression uh, from MCI, uh, from cognitively normal to, to MCI, also within uh, within the ADNI data set. So depending on uh, which population you want to enrich for, we think that the polygenic risk score approach is, a, is an effective way of uh, being able to do that. Thank you. And have you used dry, dried blood spot samples instead of fresh blood? Um, I'm racking my brains and I'm looking around uh, some of my colleagues in the room uh, with me. Uh, no, I think the answer is no, we have not done that. Um, but um, I do know uh, that the Axiom platform uh, that we've built our Variotech array on has been used for exactly, you know, for, with exactly that starting point. So there's no reason uh, why we would not expect to be able to do that. As long as there was sufficient blood or sufficient DNA in the blood sample, uh, I don't think there's any reason at all why we wouldn't be able to, uh, to use that as a starting point for a, a, a genotyping and uh, input for the polygenic risk score analysis. Thank you for that. And how have you accounted for sex differences in your algorithm? That's the first part of the question. And is it possible that females and males may have different dementia trajectories? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take the first part of that question. Uh, the, the, answer, the answer to that is we, we do, uh, or we, we have looked at age and uh, gender as covariates in the algorithm. So we, we know that there's a, uh, well, at least um, a lot of publications suggest there's a relatively increased risk associated with females uh, versus males for developing Alzheimer's disease. And, 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 you, and you can see that in some of the cohort studies, and you can apply uh, a factor um, uh, in, in the algorithm, a covariate in the algorithm, to, to account for, for both uh, gender and age differences. Um, we have to say we, we don't see a, a, in the studies we've looked at we haven't seen a massive difference uh, between female and male but you know in some studies for sure that that observation has been made uh, as for different trajectories uh, I mean I'm, I'm not sure that we've got data ourselves uh, that would um, relate to that particular question but um, uh, certainly that's something we'd be uh, interested in studying if that was a uh, of academic interest and people had uh, samples from uh, from those types of cohorts, I think it would be a very interesting research question to try and uh, ad address. Thank you, Dr. Pether. Our next question is, have you gained any biological insights about AD mechanism by the proposed PRS pipeline? It looks like it is designed mostly for early detection alone. Okay, so, so that's a great question. Um, we we have um, we're able to analyze uh, the data uh, according to different biological pathways, um, and, and that's particularly true of our so-called um, Genotor algorithm, which I didn't talk about today, but which looks specifically at pathways associated with the so-called um, mTOR pathway and, and the, the different biological functions associated with the mTOR pathway. So. Um, uh, we haven't done a lot of work ourselves. Our colleagues at Cardiff University are very interested in this particular question. And uh, it, I think it's also got relevance, uh, possibly for different uh, ethnic groups as well. So the work that we've described today is, is almost exclusively uh, done in Caucasian uh, subjects and samples, uh, simply because uh, of availability and because that's where most of the GWAS, the genome-wide association data, has been generated. Uh, which, which basically is where we link the, uh, the DNA variants to increased or decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but there's, there's a, a huge opportunity uh, outside Caucasian uh, groups. We know, for example, in China, because of the aging demographic, there's a massive problem with Alzheimer's disease. So having an algorithm that was uh, optimized uh, for, for, for use in that population, for example, would be of huge uh, 
uh, clinical benefit. Uh, we haven't done that work yet, but it's something we'd certainly like to, to look at in the future. Um, so yes, um, we, we have done some work with our mTOR algorithm whereby we are looking at groups of responders and non-responders and then trying to relate them back to different pathways uh, associated with uh, mTOR uh, biological pathway effects. Um, and we can see some of that. And, and certainly going forward, we have, a, uh, we have confidence that uh, Alzheimer's effectively will be definable uh, in discrete genetic uh, subsets. And I think there was a paper that came out last year, I think perhaps earlier this year, that suggested that there were seven or eight different um, sort of distinct genetic subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. And I think that will be consistent with what we see as well. Thank you, Dr. Pither. And we have time for a few more questions. Our next one, our audience asks, have you examined how the algorithm performs in non-European ancestry populations? Yeah, I, I think I, I tried to cover that a little bit um, in my previous answer. Uh, we, we would love to do this work, uh, but we just don't have the resources uh, at this time. There, there are just not many um, high-quality GWAS and, and high-quality and high-number GWAS data sets available outside Caucasian populations so or European ancestry populations. Uh, so that has been a limitation and it will continue to be a limitation. We know there are various efforts going on uh, at the, around the world at the moment. I'm, I'm, I can think of one example in Taiwan where there's a, a big GWAS uh, study um, going on there right now. Um, and, and in time, as that data becomes available, um, it, it should unlock the potential to, to do um, this kind of work in, you know, outside those uh, populations of European ancestry, and, and we'd be very keen to be involved in that. If anyone uh, was interested in, in that kind of collaboration, please do get in touch with us uh, after the call. Thank you. Our next question, do you envision your array and software going through a 510K regulatory approval? So um, we envisage it going through a regulatory approval, and we are going to be talking to the FDA uh, very soon through their um, pre-submission process, whereby we can get feedback on the most appropriate regulatory pathways. Um, whether that's 510K or whether that's another uh, designation, I think uh, remains to be discussed and agreed with the FDA. Uh, but certainly, we have ambitions to uh, to gain regulatory approvals in the US and Europe and beyond ultimately um, for, our, for both our, uh, well, for our whole process actually, which includes the proprietary array um, and uh, the software algorithm, the Genoscore algorithm, which is embedded in what we call our SNP fitter software platform. So yes, absolutely that's our ambition because uh, as I've explained, we, we actually believe this technology has uh, a significant uh, a clinical role to play ultimately. Thank you, and we have time for a couple of more, what are your plans for GenoScore once you have achieved regulatory approval? Well, we'd like to roll it around, uh, roll it out, uh, you know, as a clinical product around the world. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got laboratory partners uh, that can help us do that already lined up. Um, in the U.S., we work with Akesogen, who are a specialist genotyping uh, laboratory, in fact, much more than that, um, just outside Atlanta in Norwood. And we've also got relationships with Eurofins, as we mentioned earlier. So, you know, we need laboratory partners and we also need marketing partners to get this out to the widest um, audience. But, but that, that all comes in time. You know, we need to get the regulatory approvals in place first. You know, we've got this network of, um, of laboratories, very high quality partner laboratories set up for our research use only collaborations and partnerships with pharma and various academics. And I say we've worked in various centers in, in, in North America in Europe and in Australia, um, but there are there are more of those to come, and that will be all part of our strategy to roll this out as a full commercial product uh, once we get the approvals in place. Thank you, Dr. Pither. We have time for one more question. Um, our final question is, considering that the APOE genotype distribution is based on the UK population, how can this be extended to non-Caucasian populations? Okay, so let me make sure I understand this question correctly. I think what we're saying here is the um, the distribution of APOE4 and APOE3 carriers uh, that I quoted earlier 
um, was based on a UK distribution. Uh, that distribution is pretty much mimicked in, um, in, 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 in populations of European ancestry, including uh, many populations within the US. And, uh, and, and, the, uh, and so that sort of APOE4, 3, you know, about 20 odd percent of the population, uh, relatively high risk would be considered, but we, you know, that's the group we, we can stratify further. Equally, the E3, E3 homozygotes uh, that would be considered to be of low risk, you know, we showed that we can stratify those as well. So, so we can do this in, in populations of uh, European ancestry, of Caucasian populations. Outside the Caucasian populations, uh, there's work to be done. I and mean, we know it's very well documented, for example, that the APOE, the different APOE genotypes have uh, different risk profiles in uh, non-Europeans, in African-Americans uh, or, or, or Americans of African origin. Uh, African descent, for example. So, um, uh, you know, we know there's, there's some work to do here, and I don't think the genetics is, is fully understood yet, but there's, there's, there's a lot of work to do, and certainly we would like to validate uh, our algorithms in, in non-European and non-Caucasian populations. Thank you, Dr. Pither. And actually, we have time for a couple more questions, so we're going to push them through and let you answer them because your research is so wonderful. Is there an associated threshold requirement for a typical population cohort size used for PRS in obtaining significance and power of the results? And if there is, at what range would it be? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. So, so I mean, there are uh, obviously there are, there are two constraints here. I mean, well, one is the um, uh, well, I mean, those constraints really are limited by the technology and, and by what you're trying to show. And, and, and obviously, what you're trying to show is a, is a function of the difference um, in, in, the, in, the data, in the data set. So uh, we, we have um, done studies in a few hundred subjects and been able to show significant differences, and, uh, and they are statistically different. So if, if that's the sort of, I mean, that's the sort of range that we're, we're very happy uh, working with. But of course. Ultimately, what we'd like to do is be able to tell you something about the the risk score in an individual. I mean, that that's really the challenge, um, and so that's that's got to um, that that's all around fixing the parameters of the algorithm for a particular um, ethnic group such that it can be used uh, on an n equals one sample. Uh, so, so there's, there's a difference here, I think, in what the sort of size of the populations you would need to train an algorithm, and then Validate it, you know, which could be hundreds or thousands, uh, and then how you would use it in the real world, where ultimately you're after a, a, an answer in an individual. And Dr. Pither, is this currently considered an LDT by CAP? Uh, yeah. So um, the, the the partner laboratory that we work with in the U.S. Uh, certainly uh, is. Uh, we, we, we're working with them on the basis of an, of an LDT and CAP, CAP regulation, uh, certainly as an interim. Um, but we, uh, again, that's exactly the sort of subject that will be matter will be discussing with the FDA uh, in, in due course. But, but yes, I mean you can, uh, you could certainly, if, if you're interested in operating to that that kind of level of quality management, then yes, you, you can uh, obtain uh, data from this platform in a, in a clear. Uh, approved laboratory. Thank you, Dr. Pether. And how important is it for you to work with a PRS that can achieve the best AUC using the minimum SNP number? That's the first part of the question. And would you sacrifice a small AUC percentage for saving on thousands of SNPs? Yeah, well, I, I would refer um, I, I, this questioner to, 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 to one of uh, Valentina Escott Price's papers, actually, where she did exactly this, where she looked at uh, the trade-off between AUC and the number of SNPs that were incorporated into the algorithm, uh, and there is a trade-off, but but it's you, you know uh, uh, you, you know but you get to a point where uh, certainly you know the performance doesn't increase very much for the addition of a few more you know few few more hundred SNPs. I think what we have seen though is in the algorithms that use very low numbers, you know, I'm talking about tens or even hundreds, the, the transition or the translation of performance between one data set and the next seems to be very compromised. So, and, and that's probably because you're overfitting to a small number of SNPs. 
and uh, and, and therefore uh, you know that that that, that performance does doesn't translate across data sets very effectively. So um, I, I would refer uh, the questioner, uh, if the question wants to get in touch with me, please do, and I can then refer uh, for, refer them to this paper that, that, that Valentina published um, on exactly this topic. I, I think it's also worth saying that, that Valentina published a paper a couple of years ago which suggested that the performance of the algorithm that we're seeing today um, is kind of at the theoretical maximum that you would expect for late onset Alzheimer's disease, given that it's not a pure genetic disease. You know, we know from uh, identical twin studies that twins with exactly the same genetic makeup may develop the disease at different times in their life, and that's because uh, their exposure to environmental and lifestyle risks are different. So genetics in Alzheimer's disease is never going to tell you everything, but we do think that the, uh, the components captured in the polygenic risk score algorithm that we've described here with... Um, uh, with uh, genus score um, is is at or about at that that theoretical maximum performance that you're ever going to see with a, a polygenic risk approach. Thank you, Dr. Pither. And do you have any final comments for our audience today? No, I I, I think I mean I'd like to thank them for their engagement. I mean we've had a large number of participants, which is fantastic, and we've had some really good questions, which is even better. So thank you for that, and uh, I would very much encourage you to get in touch with us. I uh, my contact details are, are on the final slide in the presentation, so if anyone would like to uh, to reach out, we'd be delighted to uh, to hear from you and uh, to perhaps even put some sort of collaboration uh, collaboration together. So uh, thanks for your engagement, everyone, and I'm uh, I apologise if my uh, my sore throat was uh, was uh, too much of an irritation on the call, but uh, hopefully you can uh, understand most of what I was saying. Thank you, Dr. Pither, for your time today and, and absolutely for your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to remind the audience that joined us today, thank you for your interesting questions. And any questions that weren't answered today, those submitted during, they will be answered and addressed by Dr. Pither via email address that you provided at the time of the registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.